Friday, September 22, 2023, the day before the first day of autumn. I'm Crash Connell, and Mary Danielson is here. And if you thought uh, yesterday was awesome, hang on to your tinfoil hats. <laughs> Because we got an exciting guest for you here. Mary Danielson, it's your turn. Last full day of summer, so if you didn't get stuff done, now's your chance. Because when you wake up tomorrow, it will be autumn. So, uh, I love fall. We are welcoming back J.B. Hickson today. And I I was thinking um, about the topics we cover and the events that characterize these times. And, you know, sometimes the topics are heavy. But if from time to time, you know, we start thinking it's a bit too much, it's good to pray And just ask the Lord to replace any anxious thoughts with his perspective because, you know, being anxious about these times is a natural human response. But that doesn't change anything because the Lord has everything in hand and he can renew our minds and give us peace. And keep in mind, this is something I always keep in mind, is that we may not always be free to openly share the gospel and expose the dark agenda coming at us like a freight train. Uh, So hopefully that will cause us to make the most of our time. In other words, expect turbulence and use it to advance the kingdom and encourage one another. As J.B. says in his book, we are called to both understanding and vigilance. It's an open invitation to discern the times. Amen and amen to that. So consider yourselves invited. So we're going to continue to uh, expose and exhort as long as we are able. Let's open with a scripture passage and a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into <clears throat> our subject matter today. Scripture, Ephesians five, fifteen to 21. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Let's pray. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we are so grateful for another day to serve you, and we know that nothing happens, um, nothing that happens is outside your loving care for us. Uh, You've hemmed us in with your love and your faithfulness, and we are lost without your sustaining hand. Thank you that there is no shadow of turning with you. Uh, So we pray for your enabling uh, to continue in whatever you have given each of us to do. We pray that we can be found faithful in all things, large or small. Um, I lift up JB to you today. Uh, ask for your hand of protection on him and his loved ones and many open doors to speak truth to a lost and dying world. We ask that you walk among us today in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we have J.B. Hickson back with us today, president and founder of Not By Works Ministries, pastor of Plum Creek Chapel in Sedalia, Colorado. He's a nationally known author, speaker, and radio host with more than 30 years of ministry experience in the pastoral and academic arenas. And you can find a number of great resources at notbyworks.org, spiritoftheantichrist.org. And you can visit that for volumes one and two of his Spirit of the Antichrist books. Great resource, very comprehensive. Um, a lot of prophecy books become dated. These are not. Uh, he has a new book, Spirit of the False Prophet, The Rise of Global Technocracy. It can also be found at notbyworks.org. You can click on the store option Uh, Also, he has regular podcasts. There's a mobile app. You're a busy man. Welcome back, JB, to Stand Up for the Truth. Hey, Mary. Thanks so much uh, for having me on. Good good to be here. Yeah, uh, for such a time as this, right, there's so much going on. We are creeping toward what you call, and I love this phrase, a planetary penitentiary of control and oppression. The deep state, global elites, whatever you want to call it, they're building a global fortress around us, and they're barring the gates. We're going to be in full planetary lockdown soon, I think, on several levels. You uh, via great deception, a lot of a lot of power going on out there, um, and the groundwork on technology, JB, is no longer just groundwork. It seems like there's an on switch coming pretty soon in the beast system. Um, you know, he is the ultimate uh, puppeteer, the false prophet. Uh, do I have that right? I mean, he's the one who's helming this this uh, penitentiary. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the new book is Spirit of the False Prophet, Rise of the Global Technocracy. Uh, Folks can go to spiritofthefalseprophet.org, spiritofthefalseprophet.org, and learn all about it. It's got uh, the full preface there and the table of contents, and then it's 
kind of a summary. Uh, but yeah, the whole premise of the book is that uh, based on Scripture, the false prophet who will be the Antichrist's henchman, second in command, uh, he will be put in charge of a full-spectrum planetary control grid, uh, things like the Mark of the Beast system, where no one will be able to buy or sell without government approval, uh, full-spectrum biometrical surveillance, mm-hmm. things like that. And, uh, you know, as I, I started thinking about that, knowing that the Antichrist and false prophet are not omniscient nor omnipresent, the only way they're going to be able to accomplish that uh, biblical prophecy is through technology. And so then I started digging into uh, the history of technocracy, and that's uh, just a term that's used uh, by Satan's earthly accomplices to refer to rule by technology. And as you uh, said, Mary, uh, the stage is certainly being set as they are rolling out uh, this technological control grid uh, that I think will will fall right into the hands of, of the false prophet during the future tribulation. Yes, absolutely. And in AI, you know, I even a couple of years ago, I think we would all thought, wow, you know, it's it's and it's just rolling like a freight train. Now you util, utilized uh, Chat GPT to pen a bit of your preface uh, preface of your book. How did that go? Tell us how that went. What was the process, and and what did you come up with? Yeah, so uh, we're kind of kind of, you know, uh, tipping the hand a little bit here, but uh, if you read the book, the preface, uh, the first few paragraphs, I uh, worked with my technologist friend Shane, who's uh, on our program uh, once a week usually. Uh, He's just an outstanding expert in technology, and uh, he kind of keeps us up to speed on AI. And with his help, we used a prompt and basically asked uh, ChatGPT to write an introduction for a book about the role of the false prophet in the future tribulation period as he uses technology to control the world, something like that. I I give the precise prompt in the book. Uh, But uh, So you read the preface, and after about four or five paragraphs, then I I kind of interject and let the reader know that that uh, preface was a collaborative effort between me and and ChatGPT. The the initial uh, response that I got from ChatGPT was pretty amazing, Mary. I mean, it wasn't uh, exactly the way I would have written it, and mm-hmm. I tweaked it quite a bit, but I'd say 60% of that, those first few paragraphs uh, came from the mind of artificial intelligence, and, and that's enough that, that should blow you away when you think about the fact that, uh, you know, the terminology that he used, or mm-hmm. it used, I should say, um, it, it's really striking. And so I did that, and as I explained in the preface, I did that to kind of illustrate uh, the merging of fact and fiction, the merging of reality and fiction, uh, and how it's getting harder and harder to tell them apart. Um, so yeah, pretty uh, pretty interesting stuff. We also have a a, a dialogue in, in later in the book in chapter six, which you may be planning to get to, but uh, between AI Jesus and myself, and that is even more stunning and really disturbing. Actually, mm-hmm. yeah. Another uh, thing in the news this last week is another church decided to um, you know pursue an AI sermon. This one, that first one, I think was in Germany. Well, this was in Texas. And I'm thinking, I'm not so sure about this. And a bunch of us were sitting around at church the other night, and we were talking about worship songs. And we were talking about possibly, you know, just inputting some a psalm or something and seeing what it comes up with. And we got to talking, and all of a sudden it got real quiet, and we all looked at each other and went, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> it seems like a Pandora's box. It really is, yeah. You just don't know where you're where it's heading. And, uh, you know, it was quite a... a uh, journey for me, uh, educating myself on all this. You know, I've been working on this book uh, for the last year since Spirit of the Antichrist Volume Two came out, and you know, I'm not necessarily that uh, well versed in technology. I, I'm, I'm, you know, know my way around a little bit, but I'm not an expert by any means. And so I had to kind of uh, figure out what is ChatGPT, mm-hmm. what is AI. So I subscribed to several uh, different uh, news feeds and uh, journals and things uh, online to just kind of stay abreast and. I tell you, the biggest takeaway for me was how rapidly things are changing. Mm-hmm. It's just happening at lightning, lightning fast. It and really, really is. Yeah, you can't uh, really even keep up. Yep. And uh, Crash just gave me a note. He said that we did the same here with AI on our blog. You can see the Google Bard AI response to question: Why should people listen to Stand Up for the Truth? And it's posted at StandUpForTheTruth.com. So if somebody wants to see what that was about. It's fascinating because when I think of AI and I think I'm going to ask AI, what is deception? And I'm thinking I might get something very deceptive in response. So that might be a very strange question to ask AI. And I have never jumped into that, but someday I might give that a whirl. But it's not, JB, it's not just deception in writing. um, But with AI, deception can take many other forms. I mean, why wouldn't Satan latch on to and multiply and magnify any possible avenue of deception? 
Yeah, well, I mean, deception is the root of it all. I mean, it started that way in the garden with uh, Satan approaching Eve, and uh, that's his M.O. Jesus said Satan is a liar, and everything he speaks is, speaks you know, from mm-hmm. his own resources and is a lie. So the false prophet, who will be working directly under the Antichrist and together with the Antichrist and Satan, constitutes the unholy a trinity, uh, they're going to do everything they can to deceive the world. Several times in the book of Revelation, it talks about how they deceived the whole world. And, you know, talking about AI sermons, that shouldn't surprise us at all, because even before AI became so prevalent and, and down at the user level, uh, pastors were, were, you know, plagiarizing sermons from places like sermoncentral.com or sermons.com and things yeah, like that. True. So, uh, you know, the, the church today is largely apostate and is ripe for the type of global deception that Satan will uh, roll out after the rapture. Wow. Yes, indeed. Um, in Spirit of the False Prophet, uh, you are exposing a lot of delusion and deception. And I just want to ask you, you must get an awful lot of spiritual warfare at church or at home? We do. We absolutely do. It's, it's funny, I mentioned that in the introduction, uh, but or maybe it was in the preface, but, you know, all three of these most recent books, The Spirit of the Antichrist 1 and 2, and now Spirit of the False Prophet that just came out, we have experienced uh, some uh, pretty stunning uh, attacks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember when Spirit of, the Fal- Spirit of the Antichrist Volume 1 came out, I was giving my first presentation on it after the book was released at a conference and uh, was hit with uh, a, an acute attack of appendicitis, had to be uh, rushed to the emergency room for an emergency surgery. Right, in the, you know, at, right, It happened right in the middle of my message. And then uh, similar things with Volume 2, I kind of fell and broke a bone. And then Volume, uh, not really Volume 3, but Spirit of the False Prophet, which is kind of the third in this, in this triad, uh, you know, all summer long, we were just uh, one attack after the other. We had massive flooding and uh, damage to our property and to our office. And, uh, you know, we had uh, hail storms and just were digging out all summer. And, in fact, it delayed uh, me finishing the book. But it was like once we got past that, the Lord just really uh, kind of opened up an opportunity and, and, and I was able to kind of put pen to paper and finish it up uh, wow. right on schedule, which I didn't think we were going to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we expect even more now that we're out there speaking. I spoke on it this past weekend at a conference. I'll be speaking again twice in October at Prophecy Watchers and another conference. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, devil does not like to be exposed, for sure. And he wants this stuff to stay, you know, clouded in deception. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we've got to wake up. You know, we're trying to obey uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, which is to, to, to not sleep as others do, but be awake. Yeah. Well, and at some point, don't you just ask yourself, I wonder what form it'll take this time? I mean, you just sort of get used to the idea. And, and people yeah, but, you know, Jesus said, uh, you know, that if we should take heart, because if they mm-hmm. persecuted him, they'll persecute us. And I think it is going to get worse for all believers. If the Lord doesn't come back soon, we are entering a new phase, at least for American Christians, of persecution that we've we've thankfully never had to see before. Yeah, and we know it's warfare because it's in opposition to what we're doing. It opposes, you know, what we're trying to accomplish for the kingdom, and the Lord is always right there helping us through it. Um, but it has a way of refining our faith as well. So uh, thanks for yeah. sharing that. I think a lot of... I. These times, a lot of people are going through a lot of stuff, and, and sometimes we have all we can do to encourage one another and, and help pull one another along because it's, it's getting pretty dark. Um, you have a section, JB, the Luc- Luciferian Conspiracy, and just to show people how things have changed, I remember reading this phrase, Luciferian Conspiracy, for the very first time back in the 80s. A gentleman named Tex Mars uh, had a book, um, and he would talk about you know, 19th and 20th century authors like Alice Bailey, Helen, Helen Blavatsky. And I was a real young believer, but I remember thinking at the time, wow, a satanic agenda openly pursued and talked about in the media? What would that look like? And would our society, how would it ever allow such a dark agenda to take hold? So I kind of thought, I don't quite get this. Well, I get it now. Um, JB, what does Luciferian conspiracy refer to, and how, how far back does it really go? Well, that's a great question, and, and, and that's, I've discussed this in all three books, but particularly in Volume 1, I spend the first two chapters uh, giving the background and the definition, both biblically and historically, uh, for the Luciferian conspiracy. So it, obviously it begins in the Garden, when mm-hmm. Lucifer 
who, ha- who was kicked out of heaven because his coup attempt failed, set his sights on earth, and has been trying ever since to take over the world. Psalm 2 talks about this conspiracy as the kings of the earth and the leaders and rulers of the earth are conspiring together to take over this world and to break the, bo- the cords of, of God's control. Uh, Satan has control issues, and he's, he's wanting to control the earth, and he's using uh, both uh, evil spirits in the celestial realm, demons and such, as well as human beings as part of this conspiracy. So the Luciferian conspiracy is clearly taught in Scripture, but more than that, uh, it's a term that they use for themselves. I mean, these folks actually get their marching orders directly from Satan. They pray to him. They worship him the way you and I worship Almighty God, the Creator. And, uh, and they even dedicate their books to him. And so uh, you mentioned Alice Bailey, for example. Well, uh, she claims to have channeled a demon back in the 1930s, by the way, she and her husband are the ones that founded the Lucifer Publishing Company. And, uh, and so she channeled this demon called Master DK, wrote 10,000 pages allegedly coming from this de- demon. I believe it was coming from the demon. And in those pages, uh, 15 times she references the year 2025 as Satan's targeted goal for taking over the world. Wow. And so if you then correlate that with other printed documents and leaked documents from globalists and world leaders and members of of the deep state, as you call them, uh, we see that they have been plotting and planning uh, in earnest, really, uh, for this decade to be kind of the the final piece of the puzzle. And so it it really, there really is a conspiracy. Uh, You know, a conspiracy is just two or more people working together uh, to accomplish some evil goal, uh, usually in secret. Uh, And it's absolutely uh, happening, and it uh, certainly aligns with Scripture. Wow. Yeah, you call the those demons and evil spirits, uh, they represent Satan's boots on the ground. I think that's just a great descriptor for that. And really, the war uh, that we're in, and a lot of Christians don't even understand that we're in a war every minute. If the war is for the souls of men, right? Yeah, absolutely. Satan wants to keep the lost lost and the saved defeated. That's mm. his goal. And uh, so he's blinding men's hearts to the gospel. He's deceiving men. And, uh, of course, we know it's going to fail. And we know, by the way, that their timeline uh, really is, no, is of no matter. God's timeline is what matters. Uh, however, it's helpful for us uh, to be aware of the blueprint of the enemy. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's kind of like uh, you know, good, good stewardship to kind of be aware of the spiritual warfare that's all around us, as you talked about at the outset of the show. Well, and warfare, you know, spiritual warfare, you have various churches off on some other warfare thing, you know, taking cities for Christ back in the early 90s, which obviously never took place. The cities were not taken for Christ. But I, uh, how can we wake the church up to just understand, you know, um, open your eyes and understand why we're doing what we're doing in this war? Because they're not reading their Bibles. or They're not taking their Bibles to churches. They're distracted by a zillion different things. Is there some way that we can get the church to wake up to what is actually going on around us? Well, I think it starts with the Word of God. It's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We can't argue people... Uh, into the truth. We've got to simply let the Word of God be the double-edged sword that it is. Uh, but I actually go, you know, I'm a little bit stronger on, on how we deal with the Church today. I, and I don't want to sound too cynical, mm-hmm. but I really believe that there is an urgency to the hour right now that, that really should cause us to, to stop trying to worry about those people who have no interest in the truth. Their heads are in the sand, uh, you know, Mark Twain said it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. And so I think we mm-hmm. need to focus on those that are uh, willing and ready and interested in hearing. Uh, we can spin our wheels all day long, mm-hmm. uh, but at some point you just have to say, okay, look, it's so obvious. If you don't want to believe it, that's fine. That's between you and the Lord. But we're going to move on uh, to others. And I think the time has come for folks to, to ready their families, to ready their own households, uh, to, to surround themselves with like-minded believers, because we are entering uh, really the, the moral and ethical dark ages, I think, of, of God's plan of the ages. It should be self-evident to anyone who's paying attention. Yeah, as uh, T.A. McMahon always says from the Brian Call, we're circling the wagons these days, because you're not going to convince people, you're not going to wake people up, uh, which is very sad. I, I don't even like to say that, but I think you're absolutely right about all that. Um, and you talk about Luciferians in sheep's clothing. You say behind every false narrative is a false prophet. Now you have my attention on that. What does that mean? 
Yeah, so I thought I thought I would start the book with, uh, and that's from chapter two, with sort of a, a history, if you will, of false prophets. So I go all the way back to ancient times in Scripture, mm. in the Old Testament, and talk about the use of false prophets. But you know, when Satan wants to perpetuate a lie, he needs a human outlet to do that. And so, behind every lie is a false prophet who mm. is, you know, out there perpetuating these false narratives and. So you start tracing that, and you do, you see, in fact, that every major tyrant that sought to to, to take over the world, you know, going back to, you know, Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, or Assyria, or obviously Egypt with the pharaohs, they all had these spokesmen that were out there advancing a, a false agenda. And that's essentially, as we read in Revelation 13, going to be the role of the false prophet. Mm -hmm. He is the spokesman who's uh, turning people toward uh, the great lie of the Antichrist and Satan. And he's getting people to worship the Antichrist. He's getting them to sh take a mark of allegiance to the Antichrist. And uh, so it's just, it's, that chapter is really uh, fascinating as you see, you know, what is a false prophet? I get into the kind of the exegetical meaning of the term in the Old and New Testaments and, and, and just, uh, you know, how they're ultimately going to be uh, judged. Uh, and then church age false prophets again and again. And we see this. Jesus warned about it in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. John the Apostle warns about it in First John four. Uh, so false prophets are a reality, and you know First John four one says we better test the spirits because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many, and he's an imposter. And that reminded me of Second Timothy three thirteen. Um, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's not a very bright future temporarily speaking, anyway. So we've been warned. But the thing that really fascinated me, um, you talk about uh, false prophets claiming to read God's mind, and then you quote Genesis 3, 4, for God knows that. Satan says, for God knows that. Oh, he's speaking for God. That I never saw that before, J.B. Yeah, remember, the Luciferians, the earthly Satan worshipers, they think God is the antagonist in the Genesis mm -hmm. account, and, and Lucifer is the hero. And so they think God had ulterior motives, that God was the one lying, and so Satan is trying to uh, get inside the mind of God there, Lucifer is, and he says the reason God warned you wasn't because he was loving and, and wanted to give you free will, but he wanted mm -hmm. at the same time in, in his great love to warn you against the consequences of eating of the forbidden fruit. Rather, according to Satan, God's motive was he just wanted to keep something from you. He was he was mm -hmm. lording it over you, mm -hmm. and, and he knew that if you'd eat this, you'd, it would be better for you. So, you know, really you can't believe what God is saying. Yeah. But that's what all deception comes down to. It comes down to turning the truth uh, on its head, and uh, that's what certainly what the, the likes of Klaus Schwab and Yuval Noah Harari and the, and, and the other henchmen uh, today are doing. Wow, and, and that's such a great insight. And, and Satan wanted humans to know, have the knowledge of good and evil. Having the knowledge of evil, wow. I mean, I, I think you and I both agree at this point, we could do without that, right, in this world? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for, well, for sure. I mean, yeah. uh, we're already seeing it. I mean, that, that's the thing. That, that, Mary, when things he, are heating up in the heavenlies, and they are as we get ready for this final cosmic battle between God and Satan that will culminate at uh, Armageddon, uh, things are, if they're heating up in, in the heavenlies, they're heating up on earth, and they are mm -hmm. all around us. And that's what it just stuns me that so many Christians are asleep at the wheel and not recognizing mm -hmm. that there is an agenda here. Things are not just happening organically. There is a higher power uh, a Luciferian power that is pulling the strings. And uh, we best uh, fight this battle uh, scripturally on our knees and yeah. be prepared for it. Yeah, keep our wits about us. Absolutely. This is Standard for the Truth. My name is Mary Danielson. We're speaking with J.B. Hickson today. Um, Rise of the False Prophet is the new book. It's out. It's ready to be ordered. Um, we have about five minutes left. Uh, J.B., I want to talk about just, uh, you know, kind of open up to the next section. You know, the false prophet causes the worship of the beast. He causes the mark to be implemented. I think a lot of people in our minds, we think, well, this is all the Antichrist doing. But but what else is the false prophet? That Those are his main uh, jobs, right, to sort of be invisible and, and do all this. What else does he do? Well, he has two main goals. And by the way, we have 
comparatively little data about the fall, the future false prophet in Scripture when compared to the Antichrist anyway, but we have enough to, to get a pretty clear picture. Uh, he is, in Revelation 13, the, the beast uh, from the earth as opposed to the beast from the sea, which is the, the Antichrist. But his two, uh, his two goals, his two tasks, if you will, at the behest of his boss, the Antichrist, are, as you said, to cause people to worship the Antichrist, Uh, See, things are going to get worse and worse during that seven-year period immediately preceding Christ's return, Uh, and and it's going to really kind of shift and turn at the midpoint of that seven years when the Antichrist breaks the treaty. Uh, He kind of overthrows the uh, the Babylonian uh, system and and, and sets himself up as God in the place of the false religion, Uh, and it's the Antichrist's job uh, to get people to worship him. Remember, as I said, it's an unholy trinity, and in the same way that the Holy Spirit draws people to Christ, the, the uh, false prophet will draw people to the Antichrist. But the second thing that this false prophet will do, which is very important and occupies a great deal of material in the new book, uh, is that he oversees the control grid, the, the mark of the beast, which is nothing more than an absolute control over every human being on earth, so that they cannot buy, sell, trade, travel, really do anything without the permission of the government. And and that's really where you get into CBDCs and the digital uh, identification uh, cards and and all kinds of stuff that we see being put in place today. Wow. Wow, it is a planetary penitentiary. It's becoming one really, really rapidly. We're seeing so many things just on the horizon, just out of our grasp, but we— we know that they're coming. Uh, there's a, a headline um, I, I found this week, uh, creating a digital prison, which is interesting the way they word that, considering what we're talking about. And the WHO rushes ahead on global digital health certificates, and it says uh, the WHO is moving ahead with this health certificate, uh, an interlinked global technological system that would be used to recognize the validity of health certificates and vaccine passports, according to independent journalist James Rogulski. Um, in reality, he says the WHO is not waiting for the negotiations to be finalized. They are already moving forward with the construction and implementation of a global system designed to restrict your freedom to travel. And they're going to be meeting next month in Geneva. Uh, it's a WHO working group on amendments to this international health regulation. I mean, it's rolling along. Um, it's just a matter of uh, 307 amendments. They got a lot of talking to do, but I have a feeling they're just going to do what they want to do anyway. But I thought it was great that it said creating a digital prison. Um, and they're, they're talking about restricting uh, travel, kill switches on the electric cars, kill switches on your money. Um, we're in trouble, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not something we want to fear because right. uh, we have not been given a spirit of fear. But it is something we want to be aware of and we need to avoid. I've, I've been saying for several years now, do not take the digital ID. It mm-hmm. will be... There's really no turning back from that in terms of being able to escape the prison planet. Wow. And the rollout date for digital ID is coming up rather soon, isn't it, by somebody? I don't know if it's Klaus Schwab or whoever. Yeah, all of them are are creating their own different systems, whether it's for health certificates, whether it's for employment, whether it's for uh, currency, digital currency. But they're all going to be interconnected, Mm -hmm. and at at the right time, they're going to kind of flip a switch, and they'll all be uh, talking to each other. Wow. An article um, recently, Klaus Schwab urges world leaders to grant WF, WEF full government control over nations. He was at the ASEAN summit recently, and he, he ordered, okay, get this, Schwab ordered government leaders to cooperate with the WEF or face losing power and influence in the new global landscape. We have, uh, well, less than a minute. I think we need to come back and talk about that because I'm not sure where he gets this kind of power that he is uh, – sort of given himself but he says the world's going to look real differently after the great reset and you need to be part of it i don't know how we can order people around but here we are jb so when we come back again we're talking to jb hicks and spirit of the false prophet we're talking about um the de- definition of false prophets the demise of false prophets uh the determination you know who are they uh what did jesus say we'll talk about what jesus said about false prophets when we come back uh stay with us um fascinating uh discussion not the antichrist this time but the false prophet who will be very powerful he will have quite a bit of his own power in pointing the world to that final world leader so uh, again jb hickson is with us we'll we'll be back in two minutes with more of stand up for the truth
feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for this Friday. My name is Mary Danielson, and we are speaking with J.B. Hickson. The book is um, false Pro- uh, Spirit of the False Prophet. Um, I wanted to just talk about something that I think a lot of people uh, may not be aware of happened in the church back in the 80s. Uh, back in the mid-80s, <clears throat> excuse me, a sort of a modest trembler rattled a lot of churches in the Midwest when Kansas City Fellowship registered on the Richter scale. The buzz that we experienced here in Wisconsin was that there was a, quote, great move of the Lord going on there, and the movers and shakers were prophesying and prognosticating the path of people's lives. And you don't want to do that lightly. And they made a big mess, not merely just the direction of the church, and that was in there too. And then and then we had a strange form of spiritual peer pressure, which proposed that if you wanted to follow the Spirit, you needed to go there because you never know where it might lead. You don't want to miss out on what God is doing. And so people began to flock to this church, and then they'd return to their hometown churches with dramatic tales of miracles and forthtelling. And I believe this move was preceded by the latter rain movement of the 40s, um, the Manifest Sons of God, Kingdom Now Theology, World Word Faith, Fivefold Ministry. But this movement, Kansas City Prophet Movement, seemed to catalyze all of it. And they took previous Pentecostal excesses and they just sort of spun them in a blender and they it just came all forward with a new generation. You know, we just had had the Jesus Movement, right? And this is, this is something... Uh, very different that came out of it. Um, and so for people who thought, well, more is more, and as far as Christianity goes, they started to seek out this experiential thing. Now we had Joel's army. I think this was part of the NAR. You know, people like Mike Bickle, Bob Jones, Rick Joyner, they're still at it. They're involved in the NAR. But people were actually coming from Appleton, from our church, and they were going down there and coming back and saying, you need to do this. And it really made a huge mess and so I just want to let people know that, that I think that that is the seedbed of the NAR. Um, there was a gentleman there, uh, Ernie Gruen, a pastor down there, who, who exposed it. It fell apart after only a couple of years. We were all very grateful for that. All that to say, JB, is there have been false prophets in the church, Peter says, secretly bringing in destructive heresies. Also, Mormonism, of course, there's a false prophet right there. And it's being presented to the church today as Christianity through various vehicles and such like that. Um, what comes to your mind when you think of church age false prophets, JB? Yeah, well, in chapter two, I give a, the, the story of a, a false a prophet called the Heaven's Gate or mm. a cult. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, that was Marshall uh, Herf Applewhite Jr. And a fascinating story. There have been some documentaries uh, about it. And it's just, it just serves as a case study, uh, kind of like Mike Bickle, uh, whom you mentioned, uh, of, of false prophets. But the church is, is largely. Uh, un, you know, not discerning, and uh, this is, as you said, because deception is getting worse and worse, but um, the average believer today is not prepared to, to be able to differentiate, um, you know, Satan who, tra- you know, transforms himself into an angel of light uh, mm. from real truth. Uh, Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, yeah, there have been several throughout history, and I, and I bring that up in the book to kind of show how we are digressing towards the ultimate false prophet. Uh, you know, uh, I, I make, somewhere in the book, I make the comment about how the future false prophet is going to be the false prophet of false prophets, and in, 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 <laughs> in the way that, you know, Tom Brady is the quarterback of quarterbacks, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, I'm not a big fan of Tom Brady, but, you know, <laughs> let's face it, he is kind of recognized. Yeah, well. right, right. So, but, uh, but you know, uh, I, I think this is, this is where we're headed, and today especially, they're springing up everywhere. I mean, you know, anyone with an Internet, you know, with a computer access to the Internet, uh, you know, they can go out there and perpetuate their lies, and, and sadly they can get, get a, a, a following, and that's what's happening. Wow, well, yeah. Yeah, it's going to get a lot, lot worse, and discernment is not optional. Um, we really, really need to pray for more discernment. If you, if you feel, if you're listening and you think, oh, I really, I'm not really discerning, well, there's a lot of books out there. You can jump in and get some apologetics books, you know, JB's books, and ramp up your discernment because it, you really can learn to be more discerning. You don't have to just say, well, I don't get it. Well, you can. You just, it just requires a little bit of uh, uh, pursuing some, some knowledge and, and getting wisdom from the Lord. Um, yeah, I mean, 
Go ahead. Real quick, you know, First John 4 really is a central passage for all three of my most uh, recent books, mm-hmm. The Spirit of the Antichrist 1 and 2, and now Spirit of the False Prophet. Uh, and First John 4 talks about how the Spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in the world, and it's in this passage that we also talk about, it also talks about false prophets. And it says, as I mentioned earlier, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And, and that was written you know, 2,000 years ago in the mid-90s A.D. And so just imagine, after 2,000 more years of Satan's you know, handiwork on this earth and, and spreading his lies, how much worse it is today. So mm-hmm. it's, we are rapidly approaching, and this is what we talk about in the book with AI, rapidly approaching that, that Rubicon where you're not going to be able to tell what's real and what's not. Yeah. Well, the first thing I noticed when we got the Internet, um, which was many years ago now, just the basic Internet, was that any false teaching could go around the world in 60 seconds or less. And so it's so easy for the enemy to, to spread falsehood exponentially. It's just it's just mind-boggling. And up until recently, you know, technology was like a, a, a carrot on a stick. Oh, look, a shiny new phone. Oh, look, the new iPhone or whatever. Um, but they just want what's best for us, right? Um, you know, so these technocrats, uh, they transcend government, right? At least in their own mind. You have unelected, rich, prideful, powerful people now are calling all the shots. So it's gone. It's not no longer just a carrot on a stick, right? Absolutely. No, this next time around, they're going to definitely use more stick and less carrot. <laughs> but the Internet's a, you know, a key, key factor in all of this. It's really what led to the rapid dissemination of, of the postmodern era. Uh, and, and because you've got this, this massive super you know, information highway and nobody out there to police it. So anything goes. But the, it's going to be a key tool in the Antichrist regime, because right now, it kind of works both ways. Not only is it a purveyor of lies, but it's also a resource for finding the truth and studying and researching. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't imagine writing books before the Internet because right. I do so much of the research uh, through online magazines. You don't have to physically turn a page in a book and get out your highlighter. You can mm-hmm. do searches, and you can go quickly to a, a particular section of a book or a magazine where it's dealing with what you're wanting to write about at that moment. So, um, But to whom much is given, much is required, Jesus said. And so we want to be careful to use the access to information while we have it, but in true Orwellian form, straight out of 1984, the book, what's going to happen you know, probably very soon is they're going to turn off the Internet, or at least, uh, and they're already doing this, they're, they're, they're changing the data on the Internet, limiting your access to right. it, um, and, uh, and then, then we're going to be left with nothing but their lies. And so that's why one of the most profound uh, things that I talk about in the book is the need for print material, uh, I talk about a scene from the new uh, Mission Impossible movie where all these hundreds of people are sitting in a warehouse at typewriters t- typing out, rekeying in hard copies of, of books because this rogue AI system had started changing wow. uh, data, changing books, changing text. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's what I mean. That's just one more manifestation of the blurring of the distinction uh, between reality and fiction. Absolutely, and searches are sanitized. I, I, I can kind of remember when I started to see that the things I was searching for uh, did not come up, but rather pre-approved, pre-digested uh, searches. It, it was, I can remember a moment in time when this really took a turn. It's much harder to search for what you're looking for, um, but, you know, that's that's just the way it is. You just got to dig a little bit harder. Um, also, yeah, I mean, go ahead. It's all about uh, shadow banning, and yeah. you know, if you do a search for uh, the dangers of vaccines, for example, on Google, you're going to get nothing but page after page of you know calling that f- fake news, and that's mm-hmm. all a bunch of conspiracy theory, and vaccines are safe and effective. Nothing about the, the legitimate, scientifically peer-reviewed journals that talk about some of the dangers. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people, not realizing that, are going to think, well, I searched, and I searched, and I searched, and there's nothing out there. So Boy, that you know that J.B. Hickson, he must be a, a wacko because you know, I'm not finding anything like that on the internet. Well, that's an example. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, your next segment here is um, the role of the two IC, or the second in command, historical henchmen we have known, and it goes back to the Roman Empire. Tell us a little bit about that second in command throughout history. Yeah, it was interesting to me to to know that in the business world, the second in command is referred to using that acronym two IC, second in. Uh, command and there's been all kinds of 
literature written in journal articles. You can even take courses in it in business schools if you're hmm. getting your MBA. And uh, and so really the, the false prophet is a 2IC. He's the second in command. And uh, so I just wanted to give kind of a historical survey of of the way uh, two ICs or, or second in commands have have played a role in in tyranny, and so I went back into you know the Roman Empire with uh, uh, Agrippa, who was basically the probably one of the most well known second in commands under Emperor Augustus, and then in the Dark Ages we talked about Subutai, who was a very uh, famous, although not not well known, but very famous in his day, uh, general uh, under. Uh, Genghis Khan in the Mongol Empire, and I mean that guy was wicked to the core. Mm-hmm. I mean he just was evil, and a lot of the prevailing wicked techniques that we have in warfare today were were started by that guy Subutai. So people know Genghis Khan, but they don't know his second in command, uh, or they in the same way they'll know the Antichrist. There've been tons of books written about the Antichrist, right. but. Very few focusing on the false prophet. And then, of course, in the modern era, the most famous example would be uh, uh, Joseph Goebbels under Hitler. Right. When he was trying to take over the world, and Goebbels was, was Hitler's 2IC. Very, very interesting. I was online yesterday. This is funny because I was looking at a, an archaeological uh, article, and they had found a tablet uh, from Nebuchadnezzar's time, and they mentioned a, a second-in-command to Nebuchadnezzar. His name was Nebo Sarsakim. And he's mentioned in Jeremiah 39.3. I did not know that. But he was the one who donated the gold to build a temple to Marduk. So it's kind of a freebie this morning. I, that, that, uh, that struck me funny, That considering I was looking all these things over yesterday. And so yeah, now we, an- Another new term that I, that I learned in my research was uh, consilire. Uh, consilire is basically a member of a criminal organization that serves as the second in command to the boss, the mob boss. It comes mob boss, the, right, right. Yeah, and so these, that's, that's what we see. I mean, these guys never stand alone. They're too uh, cowardly, mm-hmm. and uh, the Antichrist is going to be too cowardly to stand alone. So he needs somebody at his side that he can kind of cry on their shoulders and give orders to and then, of course, cast blame on when things don't right. go uh, his way. Right, right. Very interesting. Now, you also have your next section in the book is about Yuval Noah Harari, and I think everyone who's listening probably knows who that is. I haven't heard much from him lately. Have you heard any pronouncements that he's been making or any media appearances? Not in the last few weeks, but the data in the book is, is really, you know, comes right up to the latter days of August. So it's okay. pretty recent. Yeah. We were adding paragraphs and data uh, about AI, for example, you know, right up to before. In fact, after we already had sent it to the editor, we were sending them updates because we wanted it, you know, things were happening so fast. But, yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating chapter. I'm going to be speaking about uh, Yuval Noah Harari next month in uh, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, at the Prophecy Watchers Conference. But we did a pretty big deep dive. You know, a lot of the people... A lot of people know some of the m- most famous quotes recently in the last two or three years, and those have circulated widely in prophecy conferences. But a lot of people don't know his background, his upbringing, just how wicked this man really is. And I state in the book that I think uh, you know he's he kind of checks all the boxes for being a candidate uh, for the uh, the role of the of the false prophet. Yeah, he certainly does. I know that that's the very first impression that that I ever had of him watching him on the news, and he had my attention, to be sure. Um, so we'll watch for him to make some more uh, statements. He's, you know, never a dull moment uh, from the cheerleader for globalism, as you call him. Uh, your next segment is Artificial Intelligence, Science Fiction No Longer, and you have, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> of course, a reference to the uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, yeah. film, uh, Space Odyssey, yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey. But yeah, it's 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 amazing. I mean, you go back and revisit that scene, and you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, it really, you know, chills you to the bone even more than it did when we first watched yeah. it back in nineteen what was it sixty eight? I think. Yeah. Man, that's been a long time ago. Yes. Uh, because now we see how these things can be reality, and having had some conversations with AI systems. Um, and, and, and to the point where you forget you're talking to a machine and you think you're talking to a real person, uh, boy, it makes that, that scene uh, jump off the page. If folks don't remember, uh, you know, that's where uh, one of the uh, you know, members of the space expedition gets caught outside the spaceship and he's asking HAL 9000, the, the, the AI computer on board, to open the hatch. And, 
And of course, the the, the AI says, "I'm sorry, Dave. I, I'm afraid I can't yeah. do that." So it's just a really powerful scene. Uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's not unlike what we're seeing today when AI has gone rogue. I give several stories about that in in the book, and and even leading you know secular. AI experts who, who are not believers, they're not coming from a biblical worldview, they're sounding the alarm about the fact that, you know, AI has really slipped from our grasp and, and it now has a life unto its own. It's funny because when I was in high school, they, they took us to a theater one day and had us watch 2001, and I didn't get it. Nobody got it. Half the kids fell asleep. But it, it's it's a cautionary tale, isn't it? I mean, here we are so many years later. Like you said, that was the late 60s. Yeah. Um, so. Well, Kubrick you know, I, I, this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but since we're talking about conspiracies, you know, Stanley Kubrick is well known for being awake to the grand conspiracy and has often telegraphed in his famous movies certain aspects of it. Uh, I talk about this in the in the book, but Dr. Strangelove um, uh, he uses comedy to kind of talk about the, the realities of nuclear war. Mm-hmm. Another futuristic uh, movie of his, A Clockwork Orange, oh, yeah. talks about the dystopian Britain. Uh, the Shining, of course, has all kinds of coded messages uh, sure. in, in that about kind of revealing what the Luciferians have been doing through the years. A lot mm-hmm. of people don't realize that. You wouldn't know it from watching the movie, and I don't recommend the movie, by the way. Yeah. It's rated R, but you can kind of read a summary of it, and, and so on and so forth. And one of the ones that I talk about in Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 2, was uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Again, don't watch the movie, Mm -hmm. but if you look at the summary, it really unveils the dark underworld of satanic ritual abuse in Hollywood. So, mm-hmm. and that was his last film. In fact, he died during production. It was it was released uh, posthumously. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's to me. There's a connection between Kubrick, uh, a space odyssey, and AI. And again, folks can uh, can go to spiritofthefalseprophet.org to kind of learn more about it. Yes, yes. Science fiction's come a long way because I'm I'm still fascinated by those '50s sci-fi movies. I, I enjoy them. I chuckle at them. And then things got a lot darker as we went along. And so because that was a part of my upbringing, everyone in our house read science fiction all the time. But some of the darker themes, the farther we got into it, the darker it got. And so we can't really say we haven't been warned by people who have thought this through. Even Gene Rodberry thought a lot of these things through. Um, In the time we have left, J.B., um, we're talking to J.B. Hickson today on Stand Up for the Truth. Uh, You have a segment on uh, in the book Hacking and Tracking Humanity, you know, with data harvesting and such. Um, Central banks, money, the U.S., America, how to escape the prison planet. What do you want to address now here in the last 10 minutes? I would like to just give you free reign to to, um, communicate to us what you find um, the most important about the last part of this book. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, to me, chapters 6, 7, and 8 are are the most powerful in the book. That's the one on artificial intelligence, the one on hacking and tracking, and the one on central bank digital currencies, uh, because they all kind of coalesce together around a common theme, which is to control us, to keep us uh, from functioning, to to limit us to 15-minute cities, and to limit how much we can buy or sell based on our carbon footprint and our social credit score and all, all of those things. And it's so easy to do. Once, once they have the data, even Harari talks about how data is really the currency of our day. It's not wow. dollars, it's, it's data. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the digital currency is something that's already being rolled out. They've got the back end in place, at least with the Federal Reserve, through the FedNow program. And so they're just waiting to kind of plug it all in and force you uh, to use it. And uh, yeah, as I talk about in the book, I believe what's going to happen is there's going to be some uh, forthcoming major unfreezing event that uh, brings the United States to its knees and forces us, as they've been talking about doing for 100 years now, to sign on to the New World Order and give up our national sovereignty. I have several salient quotes from key U.S. figures, uh, presidents, uh, foreign advisors, um, key business leaders like Rockefeller and others uh, that, that tell us that's what they're wanting to do. They've got to bring down America. Even Klaus Schwab talks about how you know CBDCs could be the very thing that destroys the U.S. economy. I've got that quote mm. uh, in the book. And so once that happens, then in classic Hegelian dialectic form, where <laughs> they kind of create a problem so that they can implement the solution, mm-hmm. uh, you know they, they're going to force us to sign on to this digital currency, where everything we do, say, see, watch, you know, where we go, even what we're thinking, and that's the the stunning part. There's a section in 
in the hacking and tracking chapter on mind control, and uh, they're they're now getting to where they can even tell from your brain waves what you're thinking. And you know, these are scientific studies that are just stunning with the use of AI that they can essentially read minds now, not only read minds but plant thoughts in your mind. And they've been doing that to Mary for decades through other means, chemical means, psychological warfare, uh, even biological means. But now it's all technology related. Uh, and so that's a pretty uh, you know, powerful chapter to kind of tell people what to avoid. But to me, the most important chapter is, the, is chapter nine, and that's called Escaping the Prison Planet. All of our books, we try to end with a solutions chapter, kind of what do we do with this? We don't want to just give the bad news. We want to give the good news. And so we've got some, a lot of great information, I think, in Chapter 9 about how to prepare. We give you lists of preparedness items and supplies and even certain scenarios to consider that you may not have thought about before. And we try to give quite a bit of practical input there so that you can think if the Lord doesn't come back soon – how we can navigate these uh, rapidly approaching new times of of this uh, global prison planet. Wow, yes, uh, it really is a prison planet. Um, Planetary Penitentiary is how we started this podcast. Uh, Spirit of the False Prophet is the book, notbyworks.org. Is is the new, are all of them, let me ask you this way, are all of them on uh, Amazon as well? Yes, all three books are on Amazon. Uh, the brand new one is on Amazon. Uh, the only thing about Spirit of the False Prophet is it's not available digitally yet. Okay. Um, to get the digital copy of Spirit of the of Antichrist, the first two, just to go to our notbyworks.org website, and you can purchase it there. Uh, but the hard copy of Spirit of the False Prophet is available. We will eventually be making it available in digital copy, um, but it literally just came out in uh, September 1st, and so uh, we are just uh, kind of getting it out there. We want to spread their word. We want people to give it to others because all of our books give a clear gospel presentation, and they explain that now more than ever people need to get their spiritual house in order, and that means for unbelievers, recognizing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died and rose again to pay your personal penalty for sin. He, he's the only one who can forgive sin and give the gift of eternal life, so you need to trust him today. Uh, this is not a time to, to delay uh, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ today for eternal life. And then for believers, that means, boy, as you started out the program saying, getting in the Word, uh, you know, becoming more and more familiar with truth so that you'll recognize the lies immediately. And, um, I mean, again, these are urgent times. Jesus told us to watch the signs of the times. And, you know, you'd have to be living in a cave not to recognize that the stage is being set for all of the prophecies mentioned in Scripture uh, to begin to be fulfilled, starting with the rapture, and then, of course, the unveiling of, of all of Satan's uh, regime. So, uh, so, so get, you know, encourage, I encourage folks to read the book and then pass it around. You know, give it to others. Um, if you're interested, like if you have a small group or a Bible study uh, and you want to buy multiple quantities, you can reach out to us at our 1-800 number on the website, and uh, Brooke, uh, my daughter, who kind of runs the office, she can help you, give you a quote. We give discounts. You know, we're not yeah. trying to make money, make, get rich off of this thing. We just want to cover our costs and get the message out there. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea is to use these books uh, for home studies and to really become equipped to understand these. There's just a lot of deep stuff, a lot of meaty stuff in these books. JB, one last question. We only have a minute or so left. Is it possible to fly under the radar? How can the church fly under the radar as much as possible in these times to get to work while there's still light? Because a night is coming where no man can work. Can we fly under the radar to some degree for now? Uh, I think you can. I think you need to plan now to do that. And then, like I said, use the technology that's available while we have it to just kind of eyes wide open, you know, Mm -hmm. be... Uh, spreading the gospel, but absolutely you can unplug, and we give some some ways to do that in Chapter 9, Escaping the Prison Planet. And by the way, like my, all my other books, there's over 50 pages of bibliographic citations mm. at the end of this book, and uh, so you can do your own research. You can double-check me, do you know, fi- you know, make sure that this this information is accurate. Um, and so there's a lot, lot available resources there for people to do yeah. their own study. Awesome. And I know people are so busy, but even if you set aside 15 minutes a day to do some research, you'll be amazed at how much you learn in a week's time. Maybe it'll turn into 30 minutes a day, but it's well worth it. Put something else on the back burner and start to do research about all these things because 
your family, especially if you have a family, you know, prepare your kids as much as you can in language they can understand without frightening them. These are teachable moments for our kids, too, that are growing up in the church who need to be discerning as well, especially our teens. Thank you so much, J.B. Hicks, and we just love having you on notbyworks.org. And hopefully we'll see you in in, uh, a few weeks here. We'll get you back on the schedule. Um, What what a, a... great set of books he has there, so I encourage people to get those. Um, coming up next week, Jonathan Brentner, Jim Farrington, da- not, excuse me, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson from Answers in Genesis. So we got a lot of great stuff coming up next week and every week. Sign up for our weekly podcast digest so you can get it in your email, in- in- email inbox. Go to standupforthetruth.com. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Have a great day.